Well, welcome to the show, Molly Bloom. Uh, woohoo! Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Molly, I was saying to Lisa yesterday, I was... I thought I was a wild one in my younger days, but compared, <laughs> compared to you, I'm actually a Boy Scout. And uh, as we mentioned earlier, as I dug deep into your past and your history, I realised a lot of the characters are, are quite interesting. You've got Player X, which is obviously Toby Maguire. You've got Rick Solomon. But the question is, um, the, the movie focuses around uh, Player X. If you could do it all over again, would you manage him differently? Or are you happy with the way it played out? So let me just put forth a disclaimer that Aaron Sorkin will appreciate a lot. Um, Player X, <laughs> in the movie, Player X is a composite character uh, oh. based on multiple characters. In the book, I do write about Toby, and I think everyone has a Toby. You know, that, that person that, that tries to, you, you know, get in the way of your dreams. Um, that person that you have to make a moral choice. Do I acquiesce to this or do I stand on my own two feet and take that big risk of pissing someone off in a power position, you know, and, and what's the choice there? And do I regret the way I handled it? You know, I don't, I mean, I, I stood up to him. Um, I didn't acquiesce to kind of like what his demands were. And, um, and I lost the game, you know, I lost this thing that I had created and, and put blood, sweat, and tears to you, but I, I maintain my dignity. And I think that that's been important to me time and time again in life. And so no regrets. I can't even begin to imagine how hard it would have been being a woman in a room full of that many egos. Um, <laughs> Because, I mean, look, as a woman in business, I always talk to Nick about this, and it's so hard sometimes when you're the only one in the room and there's literally every man fighting for it, you know, each other's attention. How did you do it? <laughs> Please give me some oh, tips. Oh, man, you know, it was, it, it was certainly like the master class. <laughs> um, you know, I think you just have to figure out who you are um, and where you're sort of where your hard line is and what you're willing to do and what you're not willing to do. Um, and then something that that uh, aided me really well was compassion and empathy. So a lot of times um, when you're in the room with powerful people, big egos, that's generally masquerading for something more raw underneath it. And so if you can kind of plumb the depths of that and figure out like what, where is this behavior coming from and, and is there a way that I can make this person feel safe or I can address the actual problem or you know like what what's the psychology behind this um, and seeking to understand people has always been a, a really valuable skill. So I think it's the duality of like, I know who I am, I know where I stand and in a quiet way, no one's going to move me from that. And then also practicing, you know, the, the other side of that, that coin is practicing empathy and compassion. It's so easy to get pissed off at people who are being jerks. It's, it's the harder, but I think more efficacious approach to actually try to understand where they're coming from and see if you can address that. The challenge is how do you manage someone like a, a Rick Solomon? The, the, the guy's pretty wild. So, yes, he can be empathetic and, and charming, but these are big personalities. Um, so it, it, like, I can imagine it would be very, very tough to manage at the time, but obviously you did and you've, you've come through it quite well. You know, the, the, the thing about Rick is, yes, he has, a, you know, a, a questionable resume in certain ways, and, yes, he's a big personality, and if you watch him at tables, um, you know, he, he seems kind of savage, but, but Rick is a really good person. Like he has a strong set of sort of morals and they're definitely left of center than most people. But like when it comes down to it, he's a good person. He's a good dad. He's a good friend. Um, he's like loyal to his people. And he's, he's, he's kind of like, he's kind of a generous, good person. Um, and that's not something that you would think or see if you just kind of watched like read his history or, or watched videos about him but like he he at the table he was one of the most like honorable good people do you, do you actually miss the life because you must have met met some really interesting oh, girl people. i'm so tired i could never do that anymore <laughs> i was gonna actually ask that the life 
<laughs> yeah, of course. Like, you know, like when I walk through a casino or, or I hear about someone who's just, you know, placed a huge bet or like won a ton of money and craps, or when I hear about these big games that still go, that still go on, it, it triggers something deep inside me. That's for sure. Um, <clears throat> but it just wasn't sustainable for me anymore. And I get my adrenaline surges in other ways now. I need that. I'm, an, I'm, an, uh, I'm a velocity, like adrenaline junkie for sure. You know, I like volatility. I like the big life. I like to be a little bit scared and, and excited at the same time. Like, but I just had to find other ways of, of, of approaching that. Um, but yeah, I mean, the roundabout answer is like, of course, there are some times where I really miss it. And then sometimes where I don't at all. And like the last thing I ever want to do is sit in a room and watch people play cards again. <laughs> <laughs> was it, was it, make for the best people watching. Was it true you were doing yeah. like two or three days straight without sleeping and just watching these people play? Yeah, it's sometimes incredible. the games would go like 72 hours for sure. Oh my God. You must but be I wasn't doing player. it sober, you know? <laughs> Like I was taking a bunch of Adderall or something like to stay up. Um, and then, you know, that has its own other life. When you start relying heavily on substances to make your life work, then, <laughs> then that's another path. You know? Yeah. What's, what was the longest game? So I think I, um, I saw and read that you, there was one game went for a couple of days and you lost over a million dollars. Was that the longest game that you saw? Because people were just, were just coming in and cleaning him up. That was the longest game in LA and New York. It got really crazy. Um, you know, people would play for like 72 hours, but it's nuts. But I mean, by that time I was like tag, you know, I, I would have someone that could watch the game for a, a little while, but that was always a nerve wracking proposition because it's so easy to make errors. You know, you give someone a chip for 50 grand and the person forgets to write it down. And like that 50 grand's on me. So it was always, really stressful to to outsource it did that lead to why you actually exited the industry or was it aside from the mafia um what made you go <laughs> no but literally aside from the mafia. but what made you go you know, this is the mafia and the feds oh yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. but would you, would you have oh. otherwise i really think i would have i i i didn't even leave after the mafia stuff like i kept going after that and it wasn't until the feds raided one of my games and seized all my assets, which completely shut me down. Now I have no liquidity. Now I can't run these games. Now people know that the feds have showed up to one of my games and like, you know, not only are they not going to play, they're not going to pay. So that the feds shut me down. I can't, so you were 26, right? When the, I think I was reading that you were 26 and you got arrested by 17 FBI agents yeah, with was, automatic uh, weapons. Yeah, that was a trip. I was 25 when I started the games, and I was 33 when I got arrested. Oh, 33. Jesus, yeah. that's so yeah. scary. And when, you were, when you got arrested, yeah. were you trying to escape at the time? Or did you go, fuck it, I've gotta, I'm just going to give myself in? <laughs> no, I. it's such a trip. So the feds seized my assets in 2011, and my lawyer at the time, you know, they had this discussion about how in America, your person has the presumption of innocence, meaning like you are presumed innocent until someone proves that you're guilty, but your property does not have that same presumption. So they, they, the government, if they have, <laughs> yeah, if the government um, has done some due diligence and thinks that you have made your money in illegal ways, they can take your money. Um, and so at that point, my attorneys were like, okay, you know, we, they had the discussion about the money and they also said, is she a target of your investigation? And they said, no, if, if we, if she is, we'll let you know. So I just went away. I moved back in with my mom. I had no money. I, you know, my life was over and it took me two years to rebuild even two years to get a job. And so I hadn't run a game. I've been living with my mom and my grandma in like the woods of Colorado. And I had just moved back to LA to start this new job. And that was when they came to my apartment, middle of the night, 17 FBI agents with machine guns Jesus. and arrested me. So it was kind of like out of nowhere for me. You know, I, 
I, I now know that they were spending those two years building a case against me, but it was a trip. And no, I didn't try to run. I was like, I'll be going, where's the window? I'm running a machine gun. I'll be bolted. (laughs) Jump out of the... It must have felt like a movie. (laughs) It did feel like a movie. It's a movie now. It really did. So so many moments of that life felt like a movie. And I guess that's why I just really saw clearly that it could be a movie. (laughs) Uh, and I still can't believe you got Aaron Sorkin, which is, you know, something that we definitely want to cover off. Um, I guess taking a big step back, it's so interesting when you, um, you know, obviously we're talking to you now and you can see, like, you're, given everything that you've been through, you seem so level-headed. Like, you're obviously a, an incredibly strong person. Um, you know, and a lot of who we are today is really shaped by our childhood and Obviously, you know, you were an incredible skier. And not only you, but your whole family. Like, Luke and I were talking about your family. It's just like, oh, my God, literally, you could still be going for the Olympics and be, like, you know, have someone else in the family, in your family, who's at the Olympics or multiple-time Olympian. And so, like, can you maybe tell us a little bit about your childhood and also... Like, I mean, your dad in the movie was Kevin Costner. That's pretty freaking amazing. I could say. I wish, if anyone was going to play my dad, I wish it was Kevin Costner. <laughs> right? I think that's secured my position as favorite child for the rest of my life. <laughs> exactly. And I had a long way to go. I had a lot of ground to cover uh, to get in that position. Um, yeah, so I had an interesting childhood. My, my mom, my parents, like, had these two sort of platforms that they parented from. And my mom's was be a kind person, do the right thing. Um, you know, integrity matters. And, and she really used every opportunity she could to, to, to teach us that, to, to use life lessons as, as teaching experiences. She also taught us to fight for what we believe in and, and that our name matters. And, you know, so, so that was kind of her position. My dad's position was to prepare us for how hard the world was. So he wanted excellence. He wanted discipline. He wanted us to learn how to suffer constructively. Um, He wanted us to understand that when you start something, you finish it and you give it your all. And so, you know, I had these two parents who weren't going to put us in front of a television. Like they were so hands-on and it really shaped and formed us. Um, my dad sometimes was a little psychotic when we were younger. <laughs> um, I remember like one particular summer, um, we lived on a lake. And so like during the summers, we would water ski and during the winters, we would snow ski. And, and my dad wanted me to learn how to get up on one ski, which is like kind of hard, especially when you're a little kid with not a lot of muscle tone. And I remember like he put me in the lake and I wasn't allowed to get back in the boat until I got up on one ski, you know? And <laughs> so it was just like time. And, 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 you know, at the time I, freaking hated him for it and whatever. But then like, I look at my life now and that's how I do it. You know, like if there's something, if there's a goal, if there's a something that I, that I'm chasing, like I won't get back in the boat until, until it's done, you know? So people, you know, people have all kinds of opinions on parenting like that. I I know my dad's received a lot of criticism um, from that, but I'm better for it. You know, I really am. And we're certainly better for the the um, the the type of teachings my my mom insisted on too, um, but I you know I can't I can't really take that much credit for and I think my brothers will feel the same. I, I really think so much of this had to do with how we are socialized. You know, my my middle brother is a Harvard professor and a cardiothoracic surgeon at Massachusetts General. My youngest brother is a two-time Olympian, six-time world champion, played in the NFL. Like, you know, that that's just those early childhood philosophies really, really had their way with us, you know? <laughs> it's actually interesting. Have you seen the movie Whiplash? If you haven't, it's... Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's incredible. It's like one of the best movies I've ever seen, but... Yeah. You, I don't know if you've seen it, Nick. I've been telling you to watch it for years. It's amazing. (laughs) So it's about a drummer and he's got a teacher and he literally, you know, don't want to spoil the movie, but pushes him to the extreme. And it's like, you know, he doesn't feel like he's doing anything wrong. I don't think he feels like he's pushing him to greatness. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so interesting because you see a lot of 
talented people who don't get pushed at all and they don't achieve anything. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as crazy as it seems, it's like sometimes you do need, I don't know to what level of extreme, but someone to really push you to help you realise your full potential. Otherwise, you might never get there. Yeah. I mean, my dad wasn't as crazy as uh, that guy in Whiplash, (laughs) that's for sure. (laughs) Um, I mean, that like bordered on abusive, I think. Yeah. Um, But... So, it was a really interesting movie though it's like at what point though yeah. <laughs> at what point do you yeah. sort of stop I mean but I think it's important to hold kids feet to the fire like you know because otherwise my dad always talks about like the kids are these like little hedonistic monsters and all they want is pleasure and all they want to do is avoid pain and if you feed into that that's what kind of adults they're going to grow into you know and so it was in, a, in this early childhood that we learned that like some pain's okay some pain's necessary. Getting uncomfortable is necessary. You can't just always chase pleasure. I took a little like deviation from that and certainly like <laughs> became like a very sort of hedonistic like adult, but I always had that self-discipline and I always had, even though, you know, my life was pretty insane for a while and I, I ran with a crew that were like just purely hedonist or whatever, but you know, I always had that, that aspect of of some sort of goal I was chasing or something I was working hard for. Like, I just never felt okay unless I had that component in my life. Your family is full of high achievers. Do you think it's, yes, your father, but also just innate natural ability? Because I, 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 um, I Googled your brothers yesterday and both mm-hmm. are very high achievers and your youngest brother obviously was a two-time Olympian, world champion, and now running a massive tech company. Like that's to go from the top of one field to another field. That's that's rare. So I think a lot yeah. of it is discipline and it, and obviously that's ingrained from when you were young, but also natural ability. Yeah, I mean Jeremy was an athletic prodigy. Like he was such a sick athlete from a very early age, and that was crazy innate ability. But he was certainly was not predisposed or primed to run a tech company. That he needed to show up and do the work and and get himself there you know I guess in a way you did the same like you were running a multi-million dollar company as well just in a different industry (laughs) I think um do you think uh Kevin Costner depicted your father well are you happy with the outcome listen Costner is an incredible actor and the script was incredible I think that you it's a movie right so you're never going to see the full dimension of a human being Um, And my dad, although he pushed us a lot, he also was very loving, you know, and he, he loved us like a lot and, and, and well. And so, and he was, and he also has like a crazy sense of humor. So I think they, that Kevin captured the, the aspect of my dad that was needed to tell that story, you know, cause it wasn't the, it wasn't a movie about my dad. It was a movie about me and how I became so crazy. (laughs) Um, So I think it was like necessary to, you know, for that character to sort of define parts of of her psychology and, and, and how she became that way. But yeah, my dad's a much more dimensional character than what was written in the movie. Oh, yeah. Were you happy with how you were presented? Because that's really quite, it must be so weird looking at someone be you. You know, I mean, Jessica be, Chastain's amazing. <laughs> yeah, she really is. I'll be honest. Um, I The producers and Aaron and everyone said, you need to sit in a room by yourself and watch this movie before it premieres. And I'm like, no way. Because I just <laughs> was too scared that, like, I would hate it or that I would, you know, pick it apart or whatever. And I just, I kept trying to coach myself into this place of, like, Molly, you're going to feel nothing but gratitude about this. Like, this is a huge opportunity. Um, This is your second chance. And no matter what this movie is like, you're just going to feel gratitude. So I I went to the premiere. I was in Canada with 2,000 people in the theater watching this movie for the first time, you know. And, like, thank God Aaron opened that movie the way he did with that, like, sort of really fast-paced, intense, awesome sports scene because then I was just in, right? <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, this is this movie's awesome, you know? And for all the, you know, coaching I did and trying to, you know, sort of cultivate gratitude, 
I don't know how I would have felt if the movie wasn't as amazing as it was because I really think it was amazing. And, and I worked with Aaron for eight months. Um, and, and I feel that that time that we spent together, and that's not generally how biopics are made. You know, generally the writer does a couple interviews, reads a bunch of uh, in the public medium, and then kind of goes off to, to sort of cre take creative license and create his own story. But because Aaron and I spent so much time together and worked together so much, it was sometimes there were parts of it where I was like, Dude, that's me. Like, what is what's happening right now? You know? Um, but yeah, I, I was super honored by the story that he told. I, it was, it was a moment, you know, it was an incredible moment. So you have to talk about how you got Aaron Sorkin. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I know it's so crazy. So, you know, I, after my whole life fell apart, pretty much in my own hands, but you know, that's besides the point. Um, I decided, you know, I, I had to be like the, I had to become the best entrepreneur I've ever become. Right. And be like, okay, what's the rebrand? What's the reinvention? Like, this is rock bottom. How, how do you, how do you build from here? And so I spent a lot of time thinking about what's the monetizable asset? What, what do I have left? What is this, does this brand have any assets left that, that can, you know, sort of help me reemerge from, from ashes? Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I just kept coming back to, it's a story, you know, you, you generate, this is a story you generally see with a, a male lead. Um, and you know, it's, it's unique. Um, and so I just, I decided that that was the way. And so I wrote this book and then I took it to Hollywood and I was getting a lot of meetings. And then, you know, a couple of days later, like I would hear nothing from the person that I had the meeting with, or they would pass. And finally I asked someone, cause this was happening time and time and time again. And in the room, I could tell that they were lit up. I could tell that they, they liked the story. So finally I asked somebody, I was like, can you just, can you just get straight with me? And, and why, why are you passing? And the answer I got was that there was this whole contingency of people in DC, in, you know, New York finance and in Hollywood that were trying to run interference on this movie ever getting made these very powerful people that were playing in this, in this game. And so then it was kind of like back to the drawing board. And what I, what I had learned from all of these meetings is that there's a short list of people in Hollywood that are all powerful and don't need to play politics. It's like the Spielbergs, the Shonda Rhimes, the Aaron Sorkins. And at the top of that list for me in terms of writers was, was Aaron Sorkin. You know, I was just, I've been a huge fan of his films forever. I think he writes with a lot of intelligence, a lot of humanity. Um, and I just th thought, let's just go for it. You know, like this is the only shot I'm going to have is if I get one of these super gods, you know, to, to be involved in the project. So then I started trying to get a meeting with Aaron and he's very like elusive. He's not on social media. You know, he's not easy to get to. Finally, somehow I just kept asking the, everyone that I could possibly find in, in my network and outside. And, and I got this meeting with Aaron and I sat down and I told him my story and I didn't really think that it would go anywhere, you know, but I wanted to try. And you know, it resonated and, and he was in, and then the rest was, you know, then, then it became, then, then the project got, got legs, you know, then the studios were calling and the, you know, the, all the A-list actors, actresses in Hollywood were reaching out and, you know, that, then it, then it started to get real momentum. Initially, were they against the movie because of protecting, say, the Tobey Maguire's and other powerful people that were yeah. named? Yeah, there was there's a lot of powerful people from politics, from, you know, billionaires, uh, celebrities, and they played in the games for years. And I knew a lot of their secrets, you know, and I've never been willing, not in a, in a federal indictment context, not in the book. You know, I talk about Toby, but I don't tell anything, any, any stories that are going to ruin anyone's lives, you know? And the only names I named in the book are people that have already talked about playing in these games. If somebody was unnamed, I, they remained unnamed. So that was never my intention, but they didn't know that. And they were understandably nervous. So. Can I ask you, because obviously you had so many different incredible players there um, and d incredible different people. Did anyone's playing style really surprise you? Because I feel like with poker, it's, it's like a really true representation to some degree of your personality. So if you're like risk seeking 
You mm-hmm. might take, you know, bigger risks when you're playing if you're more conservative. Like myself, I'm like probably the most conservative poker player. I sweat over like, t- t- you know, two dollars. Sure, <laughs> losing two dollars. Uh, you know, was was anyone's playing style? Because Nick was actually telling me that he saw that Leo um, always folded. I was like, Leo always folded. I didn't expect that from him at all. So was there anyone where you just like, that's weird. That was so unexpected to what I was thinking. Yeah, I mean, especially in the beginning, you can't tell. You can predict, but there are people that surprise you. And and, and the thing is, is like you can ha- someone can be the wildest, craziest person, and you know, party a lot and wh- whatever. But at the table, they could have a completely different personality. It's really, it's really their approach to to money, kind of, you know, and to risk. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. When you take a step back and. Um... Talk about Dean, the one who actually got you into the game and industry. Um, I was curious to know why you took such abuse from him. At the, like he was, according to maybe he threw things at you, talked down to you all the time. I'm like, what the fuck? Like, why is she taking this? Yeah, I, yeah. I think a lot of people ask me that, and and um, a couple things. I was learning a lot. Um, I was learning a lot about deals and finance and negotiation. Um, I was being exposed to a world that I had never had any exposure to, and I was pretty fascinated with it. Um, The other piece of it was uh, I'm competitive and sometimes to a fault, you know, like, F you, you can't make me quit until I, you you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, I think that as I think something I've learned in, as I've gotten older is to decrease my pain tolerance (laughs) as an athlete. And, you know, as a, as a a child of like a taskmaster, like you learn, you know, there's, you you learn that, that you just kind of like suffering is like part of it. And as I've gotten older, I think discipline is part of it. I think being able to get uncomfortable is part of it. But I think there's a certain level of of pain and suffering that I just won't do anymore. But at 23 years old, I, you know, I was like, whatever. I wanted to see this world, you know? And also, I think, and I don't know what you were like at 23, Molly, obviously a lot more advanced than I was, I was a mess at 23 but you know as a woman in their 20s like I don't necessarily feel like I had not to say a lot of confidence but I think it's much easier to take advantage of a woman in their 20s than one in their 30s and 40s when like they're a lot more confident in themselves especially when you're sort of just starting out and Mm -hmm. you know it's a new industry and you're dealing with you know um, you know senior men it can be quite easy to feel not to say less than them but you don't necessarily you know you take a lot more shit than you would now for example and I don't know if that was sort of similar I think that's a great point and I think it's absolutely accurate yeah yeah it's hard yeah Nick you've got no idea I always talk to Nick about how hard it is for women in business we we (laughs) always have this debate and I think it's oh I just don't even start this This is a rabbit hole we'll go down (laughs) (laughs) we debate this all the time I think that there's disadvantages and advantages that you can use Oh, yeah, doggy. So yeah, cute. Is that stuff? <laughs> yeah, I thought I heard something growling before. Yeah, I was trying to. I was going to say, not what was that? <laughs> I was like not liking Very the line of questioning. <laughs> um, Molly, I have to ask because you know this is like not a serious question, but um, obviously J Lo and Ben Affleck just got back together. I personally love them as a couple. <laughs> But I know I was re- reading about how I think it was Rick was asking about Ben Affleck about J Lo's butt. Did that actually happen? Because that's so random, yeah, but it so funny. Actually happened. It was like so mortifying. <laughs> um, but you know, Ben handled it well, and it was just like really clear how much respect he had for her and has for her. And you know, Rick just has no filter. Like there might be some. <laughs> it's like in his head, and he says it out loud. You know, so. He can be a liability when you're bringing in like a new player, you know, that's like, um, that doesn't understand that about him. Anyways, Molly, that's all behind you now, these wild, wild days. So um, <laughs> what's, 
next for you? Obviously, you've got a new book on the on the horizon, and what else are you doing these days to keep yourself entertained? Yeah, I'm just working on a couple different projects. I've been really consumed with writing the second book. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I'm working on a podcast with Film Nation and Sirius XM called Torch. It's about Olympic scandals. Um, in the Excuse. process of developing oh. it. Yeah. Juicy. I'm going to listen to that one. <laughs> yeah, it's good. There's so many crazy stories. Um, I'm working, we're developing a documentary right now that will be sort of in conjunction with the book and, and um, also working on a little tech project. And I'm pregnant. Hey, <laughs> oh, congratulations. congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> so also working on that. It's been a, cr it's been a tough three months, let me tell you. Why are you? Girl. Oh, you got the girl. I got two girls. A mini Molly. Do you? Yeah, uh, I got two baby girls. Naughty boys get girls. So. Yeah, yeah. you do. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. That's your karma. Oh. What do naughty girls get? Naughty girls? I mean, I'm in for it, too. Oh, oh, yeah, you're in me. trouble. <laughs> naughty girls get girls, I guess. That's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this, this child has been sent to uh, <laughs> even the score, I guess. So you're three, you're three months in? I'm uh, three and a half now, yeah. Oh, starting to awesome. get out of Congrats. that. Yeah. It's exciting. So actually, so you were just prior to um, signing the interview, you were, talk, you were telling us about the second book. So mm -hmm. are you able just to elaborate on what you're, you're working on? And, and also, I'd love to know, like, is it quite confronting? Because you're reliving, because I think you were mentioning it was obviously your lowest time. Like, is that a, like, a lot of trauma to bring up? You know, the, writing the first book was really hard because my life fell apart. I was devastated, probably like clinically depressed about it and a um, ton of anxiety over the uncertainty. And my solution was to write a book. So I had to go right into it, right into that material. And the, and the last thing I wanted to do was, was think about it. I wanted to get under the covers and Ooh. freaking stay there for, for, I don't know, ever. <laughs> I wanted to hide from it all. But writing that book was so cathartic, you know, just forcing yourself to sit Ooh. down and, and, excuse me. That was Lisa. Me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so this book, uh, you know, I have some perspective. Um, this book, Molly's Game was for me. It really was. It was to save my own life. This book, I feel very much that I'm writing for other people, other people who are stuck, other people who have made bad choices, other people who feel powerless over their lives. Um, this is, <laughs> sorry guys, right. I don't know. Do that, no. Hang on one second. Yeah. <laughs> we can edit this out. So, this is a real life, no, keep it in, it's nice and raw. So Molly's just gone to answer the door. <laughs> We're gonna deliver what do you what do you like as a poker player? Have you played poker? Do you know how to play? Yeah, I know how to play. I'm not any good though. I'm I think I'm I'm too soft with it. Like I don't I'm not a bluffer. If I if I've got a bad hand, I'm like, nah, I fold. Yeah, you wouldn't I'm, be a good I'm a big wimp when it comes to poker. I'm like, I'm, yeah, I'm a massive wimp when it comes I hate losing money. So I'm like, no. Nah. <laughs> I'm not a gambler. We're just talking about our poker styles, <laughs> Molly. Yeah. So should we get a game going? <laughs> now that I know you're <laughs> <laughs> and I know your weaknesses. Oh, oh my god, yes. It's so That's easy to, to read our tells. Exactly. I'd be like sweating. Now, now all in on every game. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like my kind of my kind of game. <laughs> you must get so many people though who ask you, can you organize a game of poker? <laughs> <laughs> I do. Yeah. yeah. Um and you know, I've done it a couple times for charity. Oh yeah, that's good. Yeah, I think the feds are okay with that. <laughs> God, how creepy must it feel to think back and the feds were probably watching you for years. <laughs> that was, by the way, that was insane. And then what happens is after they build the case against you and the 34 other people in your case, most of which, most of whom I had never even heard of before and were like serious Russian gangsters. Oh, shit. Um, then, they then they just release all the information to everybody. Oh, so like your phone calls, like, <gasps> yeah, it was... And yes, it's so crazy to think about someone just following you and taking pictures of you and listening to your, you know, conversations. And I mean, it was, 
there was so there was so much stripped of me you know like first your money and your security then your like freedom then your dignity like it was you know it was a it was a it was a situation <laughs> i thought it was a situation with the russian gangsters that's crazy yeah. crazy no, that, uh, i couldn't imagine the arrangement yeah like you actually yeah. had a life or death experience like one stuck a gun in your mouth like how do you even yeah. recover from that and how do you keep going i love that you're just like oh just keep going well, I mean, I, I was pretty confident that they got rounded up in that because, you know, after that happened, a couple of weeks after that happened, um, I got the New York Times and it, on the cover, it said 125 people arrested in the biggest mob related takedown in New York City history. And I never heard from them again. But, you know, by then I was just so reckless and so out of control. But it's interesting. That caught up with me, um, like almost right around the time that the movie came, was about was about to come out. Cause I think I just got so hyper-focused on fixing everything and, and a comeback. And then when I finally kind of knew that it was gonna happen, then I, I had this weird like response where I was started having crazy nightmares and thinking people on the street were gonna hurt me and, you know, like having a lot of trouble sleeping at night. And so I had to do a lot of work on that. Um, and meditation was a godsend for me in, in uh in processing all that stuff but yeah it just kind of snuck up on me out of nowhere it was super weird when Bork on the uh, all the movie came out did you receive any threats from anyone even the, the mafia or someone just goes do not release information no everyone's quite cool no i mean i, I <laughs> quite the... you, you're basically potentially talking about characters and they're going to be named yeah. in certain areas it's going to be a little bit dicey yeah yeah i mean i i didn't no, really know anything about the Russians. Like I really didn't have information on them at all. Um, that was just how they, the feds found their way to me. Um, but those guys had never disclosed that they were running the biggest insurance fraud scheme. Like I didn't know, I didn't have any information on them. The information that I had on the Italian mafia was like some dude came to my door who I've never seen before and like beat me up and put a gun in my mouth. So it's not like I knew anything about their inner workings either. Um, but again, they didn't know that. So it was all super sketchy and terrifying. And I was like, I, you know, it was like 50, 50, whether I was going to live through that, you know, I'm just not sure. Jesus. Did you ever want to just change your name? Because I feel like, you know, and, and you know, Nick owns a company that gets rid of like negative reviews online and, and cleans up people's re reputation. Profiles, <laughs> yeah, it's handy. Oh, yeah. we go My name's not really Nick. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I like that about you. Um, you know, I didn't. It's it. Maybe it was youth. Maybe it was just kind of hubris. But like, I just always thought I could figure it out. That's I've just I've I've always been an optimist. I've always had a little bit like maybe so, at times like a delusional sense of self. Like I've just always thought that like. I could figure it out. Um, and that's gotten me into some, you know, good places and some bad places. And I think as I, as I get older, I get a little bit more humility, but I don't want, I don't want that part to go away. Like I always want to be an optimist and I always want to believe in my abilities to figure things out. I just want to stop making so many messes. <laughs> you know? like, that's what keep things, keeps things interesting, right? Yeah. But you know, it's also just a lot. I mean, it's a lot of work. <laughs> I love that you're actually going around talking to businesses and, and yeah, things like that, that because, different. because I was talking to the team at Big Speak who obviously represent you for your talks. And yeah. one of our clients is Mark Randolph, who's the co-founder of Netflix. And yeah, they yeah. were saying, cause we we're talking about a podcast and then they said, you know, um, have you heard of Molly Bloom? I was like, oh, yeah, that's that movie. Mm -hmm. And um, Rebecca was saying, you know, she's like our most pop one of our most popular speakers. I was like, <laughs> what's so she talking true. about? That's a bit people random. Love and the then, people love the gods. They love the <laughs> But, yeah, people love, yeah, yeah, yeah. obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Celebrities, drugs, yeah, all that, you know, um, oh. power. Like it's intoxicating. But I was thinking, what on earth is she talking to companies about and teams about and and then I watched the movie that weekend I was like 
um, which is amazing. And then I started listening to all your interviews and it, it's really like you were – and this is something that really resonated with me. It's Especially as a woman, like you were talking about, you know, not being afraid of making mistakes – and, mm-hmm. you know, giving people a second chance and that concept of redemption. And I was like, oh, mm-hmm. that's – it's actually quite powerful, especially for a lot of people in business. So, no doubt. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So is that sort of like – is that what you, you talk about a lot when you're doing your talks to businesses? Yeah, I mean, it, it ranges, you know. Like, it depends on the company and what they're, what they're interested in. But I talk a lot about resilience. I talk a lot about sort of the playbook for success, for overcoming odds, Um I talk a lot about reinvention. Mm. I talk a lot about, um, you know, growth mindset and r- different concepts I've learned in sports. So, t- you know, I talk a lot about risk, like, you know, what I've learned about risk from poker. Um, <clears throat> and then sometimes I talk about, you know, c- creating a really unforgettable customer experience. Oh, I love that. What's your number one tip for that? Um, number one tip. You know, I think it's about the simple concept of like kind of what I was talking about, like the how my dad describes children. It's like, you know, human beings love pleasure and 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 hate friction. <laughs> so, how can you create this experience that leverages pleasurable experience and eliminates or, you know, decreases points of friction? Um and and I think that that's really a good recipe to follow. And then also empathy, you know, using your own humanity and trying to understand people and, and realigning your, your sort of matrix for success to like, how can I serve, you know, as opposed to like, how can I serve myself? Um, so, yeah. Well, before we wrap up, I must, uh, I must thank you. I've started organizing underground poker games. (laughs) As of, as of yesterday, I've been shooting some texts out, making some calls because we're in lockdown in, in, in Australia here. So I'm like, yeah, what else are you going to do? Gonna, yeah, what else are we going to do? So I've already got ten plans organised. So much thank you for that. You motivated me. Awesome. Well, if you, you know, I'm I'm a, I'm around if you need some some tips. <laughs> you can host it remotely. I've got, I've got a 20k <laughs> buy-in, guys. Let's do this. <laughs> Don't recruit the Russian mob. <laughs> Honestly, though, like when we were, like Nick and I were talking about the movie, I'm like, what are we doing in agency game? Honestly, it's such a slog because we both run digital agencies. Like, what are we doing? It's like literally we should just be doing poker. Like, that's it. Like, so you would die after a week. You don't drink. I would. You don't party. <laughs> literally, you'd be wasting your time. Yeah. Although, would I be amazing? Because I'd be really sober and... <laughs> And you would just like you would you would just hate everyone though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, can you imagine? Just every night you're surrounded by drunk idiots. Yeah, like, just yeah. I, I never drank at games in LA for the six years I started drinking in New <laughs> 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 Yeah, I'd, I'd yeah I'd be bored to tears, but you know. Um, yeah. maybe the money's worth it who knows uh, but thank you so much honestly I feel like I could just talk to you all day you've got yeah, so many I interesting like stories I could talk to you guys all day too thanks for having me oh you loved it oh, thank you. yeah it was your story unbelievable I loved every minute um, of kind of deep diving into it so thank you for that yeah, yeah I'm getting goosebumps thinking about the movie like that when you were talking about the opening scene I was like getting goosebumps and like just yeah that thinking about it and... saved my life yeah. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I was sitting in that theater, I was like, I'm not going to live through this. And then I'm like, oh, okay, well, it's a sports movie. Great, let's do this. Yeah. <laughs> Can I actually, just really quickly, um, so did you pick who would play you? Or did you, did you have any, because that's, because I was thinking about that question the other day. It's like if I was, you know, if I had a movie about my life, who would play me? And it's, it's quite a hard a question because even. Good question. Yeah. Because if you could pick, who would you have picked? You know, it, when Aaron signed on to do this, like I'm obviously like you guys, I'm type A and I like to manage and control things and it's hard for me to outsource and whatever, but here is one of the most prolific filmmakers of our time. And it, I just really knew it was time for me to step back. Um, and so I didn't do what I would normally do, which is be like all up in everyone's business, you know? <laughs> and, and so, you know, Aaron started conversating with actresses and he was sending me different um, women that wanted to play the role. And Jessica had just blown me away in Zero Dark Thirty. I thought that she was so fierce. 
and and really just pulled that role off. And and so, you know, when he talked about speaking with her, I was I was over the moon, you know? I mean, there were a couple people that he was talking to that wanted to play that I was like, oh my God, is this real life? Can you say who they are? <laughs> Probably not. I don't even think <laughs> they're supposed to tell me. But, um, off, off, um, off camera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, I thought Jessica did an incredible job and, and she she's one of my favorite actresses and, you know, so... It- she really did. Because when I listened to interviews with you, I was like, oh, my God, even her voice sounds the same. I, I know. <laughs> that was, yeah. like, that's amazing acting. Like, yeah, and I think it had a lot to do with Aaron's writing and directing um, because he spent so much time with me. So he was able to really, you know, sort of get the pace of how I speak and, and you know, just sort of like idiosyncrasies about how I communicate. So, Yeah, she did an in, insane job, especially I know with Aaron's Aaron's um, writing, it's very text heavy. It's like, you know, it's word, it's word oh heavy. Words. What about Idris has to do it with like, you I know, know. Like suppresses like British accent. Oh, yeah. I know. He was really good as well. I actually really liked him in the movie. Yeah, no, yeah. he's incredible. Um, really sure. attractive as well. That doesn't hurt too. Yeah. But, yeah. but yeah, honestly, yeah. I'm just thinking, how are these guys, how are these guys remembering all the words? Like I, I remember watching Newsroom. I'm like, Jesus Christ, this is just right? so much text. I know, no, lots of words. <laughs> So much dialogue happening. Yeah. Um, I know. I reckon I know who Nick would say, who, who he'd want to play. Who, who is it, Nick? It'd have to be Jason Statham. Oh, right? Because we've got shaved oh. heads and we both do gymnastics. <laughs> that would be dead on. That's who I would have said in a heartbeat. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say Jason yeah. Statham. But I am taller, so I'm not that sure. Oh, Jesus. So, I mean, yeah. Like, Please don't flatter him, Molly. No, no, he's got a big it, enough it, ego. I'll be it? very, very lucky if Jason Stephan ever played me. But literally, I'll probably kill myself the next day. Because I'll be so happy. I can see it. We'll just get him some, like, platform shoes. Maybe more David Spade or something. Uh, no, I'm, what about I'm, you, I'm Lisa? You Fuck you, Lisa. <laughs> oh, I would die for Lucy Liu. Like, she's just she's a bad. boss. Yeah, she's a badass. Um, probably absolutely not representative of my life. She'll be like, where? <laughs> she's you are not, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, she's she's amazing, and really, I guess you know, pioneered the way for Asians in Hollywood. Yeah, um, you know, totally. she's and literally, she literally hasn't aged. I'm like, All right, Lisa, it's not about you here; you? it's about Molly. <laughs> yes, Come on. <laughs> Um, so, but yeah, Molly, massive congratulations, um, on everything you've Thank achieved you. and just, you know, for coming out the other side and, and being, you can just tell like, you're such a good human, you Thank know, you. like you're a really good person. And, Thank um, you. yeah, if anyone hasn't watched the movie, do it literally tomorrow. It's the best. Read the book. I can't wait for the second book. Hopefully we can talk to you when your second book comes out. Yeah, I would love that. Let's just, let's just do it. Yep. Maybe over a game of poker. I was ben Affleck. It, we'll and then we'll ben have Affleck and J-Lo. Yeah. <laughs> together definitely well all the best molly thank you so much again and uh yeah all right take care of yourself stay out of trouble (laughs) bye bye bye